Welcome to Wisconsin Community Media's Steps to Success series. It's a quarterly series. This is the fourth in a series called Green Screen Secrets. This uh, webinar is sponsored by Laytronics. And so I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Mason, who is the inside sales manager for Laytronics to do a little introduction. Take it away, Sarah. Thanks, Mary. Welcome everyone. Uh, Laytronics is very happy to be sponsoring this session in the Steps to Success webinar series. Uh, I know most of you, but I'm Sarah Mason, the inside sales manager with Laytronics. I wanted to take just a few minutes today to share that Laytronics is excited to be working on the release of a brand new product for our broadcast customers. Uh, for many years, in addition to our broadcast products, we've had an IPTV interactive television solution used for in-house communications um, in a building or across multiple buildings for things like digital signage, um, video on demand, training videos, you know, emergency alerts, that kind of thing. We are excited to be combining our expertise and that platform with features that our traditional broadcast customers also need in a brand new product that will be called the IP Merge NX. So broadcast features will include things like HD, SDI inputs and outputs, um, of course, recording web-based scheduling and management. So something new for Laytronics for those of you who've been using WinLGX for a long time. Um, automatic gap filling, you know, for your signage and your bulletin board content, live video pass through, several uh, internal storage options, uh, support for closed captioning, and much more. Um, so what's great is not only can this product take care of your broadcast playback needs, but it can also incorporate components for internal video communications for your facility. Um, so we've been told by several customers that this can possibly provide uh, additional funding sources for the equipment because in addition to being used for your broadcast channel, it can also be used for in-house communications and, and the content of those things can be separate and different. Um, so that seems to open up a door for additional uh, funding for something like this. So I wanted to share that feedback with all of you in case that's helpful. Um, so all of this, this new product, it'll have a price point that starts in the same range that our Ultramexis HD video servers did uh, between, you know, 12 and 13,000. Um, so we're very excited about that. So IP Merge NX, stay tuned, watch for more. Um, and then in addition to this, of course, we still have available for you all of our Vibe at streaming services, which include both live and VOD. Um, our newest feature for live streaming called Vibe at Meetings, which helps you to stream your Zoom meetings right to your Vibe at platform rather than having to share a link and all that good stuff. Um, so that's called Vibe at Meetings. Of course, that came out of necessity a couple of years ago. Um, so if you have questions about any of these things, please uh, feel free to reach out to us at sales at latronics.com or if you've got my contact information, go ahead and, and reach out directly to me and I will be happy to keep you posted on you know, the exciting release of this new product and answer any questions that you may have. And I know none of that has anything to do with green screens. <laughs> But with that, I will turn you over to Ross and Scott and whomever else will be presenting this afternoon. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks, Sarah. And uh, we have, uh, I'm happy to introduce our, one of our multimedia producers, uh, Scott Marinick, who is uh, the, the man when it comes to uh, using green screen, at least around here. Um, and he has got some, he has set up some examples and some pretty good uh, pictures that you're going to see about uh, dealing with green screen. So Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all here. Um, so what, see here, I got uh, what's going to be getting covered here. Um, after just a brief intro and a little refresher, so we're all on the same page, what exactly is green screening? I'll go into uh, types of green screens that you can use, um, space and how it affects your shoot, uh, what to consider, lighting. And this is the big one, lighting is capital letters lighting. Uh, camera setup, mistakes to avoid and editing. And ideally all of this is so that that last one, editing is as easy as possible for you. 
All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Oh, I just need oh, permission to do that. Sure. And I know I'm pretty much everyone's on mute, but if I got the chat open, if anybody has questions or needs me to clarify anything like that, I'd be more than happy to. And you should not be able to share screen. Okay, got it. All right, everyone see that? Perfect. Okay, so just simple description of what green screen is, green screening, chroma keying. What it is, is we're just trying to get, we're telling uh, our program, what I'm using right now, After Effects, we're telling our program to get rid of one color so that we can show the thing behind it. After Effects, easy enough. Grab my green, boom, it's gone. Now, the trouble come up comes up with, um, number one, the program itself. Uh, After Effects is pretty robust, but it can't read our minds. Uh, if there are mistakes, if there's inconsistencies in there, it's not going to know what to grab. And we got to make that as clear as possible for it. Um, there are things that we can fix, like After Effects, as you can see here, has a whole lot of different keying uh, effects that we can put into it. But I may mostly want to just focus on the one, because this is one that you're going to be able to see in other programs. This is one that you're going to see in... Um, like Adobe Premiere, there's similar ones for Avid, Final Cut has similar ones like that, and um, even like free programs like Blackmagic, um, their DaVinci Resolve program is going to have something similar to this. So this is the only one I'm really going to be focusing on. Um, there are, so there's a lot of things that you can do to compensate for this stuff, the mistakes are going to be made, but it's sort of like if you were you didn't have the correct white balance when you shot something. There are things that you can fix, but it's just gonna to be too hard to kind of get those colors exactly right. Your quality is gonna degrade. So here are just some things to consider so that you get the best image, you get the best, uh, you get, you get the best um, product coming out there. Um, so the big thing we wanna be focusing on is making it clear and obvious what we are removing. We want as clean of a green screen as possible. So, uh, as I said before, uh, first thing we're going to be cover is uh, different types of green screen that you can be using. All right, so I'm going to pull up. So, most shopping sites, you know, your big uh, uh, suppliers, things like that, are going to probably have something like this. Uh, you're just looking up for, for green screening. There's these pop-up ones. There's the, um, the, the um, like, fold-out ones that you can put behind you. Streamers use these. People who are just doing a lot of green screening from just something right in front of their, their computer are going to be using something like that. There's also um, sheets of fabric that you'll be able to get and just getting stands to uh, prop them up. Um, there is also just what we did. There's good old-fashioned chroma key paints. And what we did in our studio is we just painted a whole wall green. Now, a lot of these have their um, pros and cons. I mean, obviously, with the green screen uh, wall that we've painted here, it gives us a nice, even flat surface. We don't need to deal with wrinkles. It's a lot easier to light. Problem is, it's, it's not going anywhere. So you can get things that are a little more mobile, like the fabric um, or this pop-up sheet, but they have some problems themselves. Fabric can get wrinkles in it. Uh, this pop-up one, these ones tend to have, and this even this one up here, they, they tend to be uh, pretty tight and pretty small. So sometimes that requires you getting closer to them, and the closer you get to the green screen, the more problems that can occur. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so why green? Why green over other colors? I'm sure you've seen like, uh, uh, like news stations used to always use blue screen for when they were doing their weather uh, weather updates. And Blue and green are the most common colors you're going to see because they're on the opposite side of the color wheel of like natural, uh, like human skin, like human skin's just got a lot of red in it. So they're, they're on the opposite end of the color wheel. So it's just an easy dividing thing to take out. Uh, blue is less reflective, which is good if you got a tight space and you're gonna be closer to your green screen. You don't want something that's gonna reflect on your subject a lot. Um, but a lot of people wear blue. You know, we will, we're, you know, wear blue jeans, some it's a more common color to come up. So green, it tends to be the preferred one. Um, and I'll show you how reflective surfaces can kind of give you some trouble down the line. So that's just something to consider. Big thing to consider also when you're getting your green screen is how much space do you have? Um, the, 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 you can do green screening in tight areas. Uh, it's doable, but 
ideally the more space the better because one thing that you're really going to want to be considering is lighting your green screen and your subject completely separately it gives you more control over both uh, ideally you would like to at least be three to five feet away from your green screen most people places will even say eight feet but you know that's not completely doable we're small studios or maybe just a handful of people or you're maybe you're doing a one-man show here it's, it's it's not going to be exactly feasible so these are just things to consider uh, when you're setting things up what problems could be coming down the line now lighting as i said before you want to light your green screen separately from your subject. Um, oh, you know what? Pardon me. So, when we're considering, even less before we get into light, we, uh, get into lighting. What we're considering is what are we going to be doing with our green screen? What's even the point of why we're doing this in the first place? So, we here at Elk Grove, well, we have a uh, regular news program that we just have an anchor in front of a virtual set, um, and that's the most common thing we do. So. That's, I'm going to be just showing you examples for this. So when you're starting to get ready for your green screen, just consider what you're going to be using it for. And if I'm using it for this sort of scenario, uh, that's what I'm going to be planning on. And that's going to examples I'm going to be showing you, to you from here on out. Um, so for something like this, the way I want to light it is I want it lit. I want my green screen lit as flat as possible. And then I'm going to be lighting my subject. And here, since we're using a virtual set, I'm going to be using the sort of lighting that I would use if I was standing in a real set, which is key light, light, and a backlight. Um, but first thing we're going to focus on is lighting your green screen. Because your green screening is kind of the most important thing right now, is you're going to be lighting your green screen differently than you're going to be lighting your subject. It's kind of a different headspace that you got to get into. So I'm going to go over to my example one and I'm going to go to my buddy Elvis over here. So number one problem with green screening is uneven lighting. Uneven lighting is going to give you the biggest headache. It's going to make it the hardest thing to, to compensate for. And with Elvis here, we've got a couple of examples of uneven lighting. Biggest one we can see is these wrinkles. Wrinkles are just giving us a ton of different shades. Uh, another big one is we got shadows. Elvis is sitting too close to the green screen, so we got a big shadow to deal with. And then another one, which is a little harder to see, is hotspot. You can maybe kind of see it here. Uh, I, I see it the first thing I look at it because I'm always looking for this sort of thing. But this shade of green is a lot different than this shade of green on the outside here. So if we do our key light, we put it into our program, we pop it in. Sorry, my bad. I had the wrong one selected. You can already see it's having it's already going to have some trouble uh, picking out exactly what we need. We still got a lot left over over here. We've got some funny looking edges with here, and this is adjustable. There's some things you can do, some sliders you can move around. But the problem is, is that if you're compensating for this other stuff, you're going to be losing information that's on your subject. And you can see here, like even just from the sides. We're losing stuff in the middle here because it's overcompensating for those darker colors, that darker shades of green, it's starting to now pick away at it on the inside here. And if we are maybe a little, if we try to pull that back, you're gonna start getting that green glow on the outside. And that's something you wanna avoid because it just, it looks fake. It looks obvious that you're just using a green screen, but you can still see part of the green screen while it's being used. Uh, so two easy. So out of the three major issues, two of them pretty easy. You got wrinkles. Uh, you got a piece of fabric. Just get some clamps on as many sides as you can, and just get that thing as taut as possible. Pull it apart. Um, if you get some deep ones, you can steam it maybe a little bit. Uh, but the the, yeah, the idea is just trying to get that as flat as possible. Shadows. Step away from the the green screen. Those shadows are going to be super obvious when you have everything cut out there. Now, the big one uh, that we're going to be focusing on now is hot spots and making a nice even green. Uh, as we now, this is this is our green screen in the studio. I just have the fluorescent lights on that are in the studio, and that looks that doesn't look too bad. 
that it looks like a pretty good green plate right there. I got someone standing in front of it. It seems like the program is going to be able to just easily pull that out. Unfortunately, that's not this. What our eyes see are going to be a lot different than what the camera and what the program sees. Because what your camera sees, and what your program sees, is this. It's seeing all those different shades of green. So the problem is, so now we get to how do, well, how do we see this when we're out filming? Because, you know, it looks, it looks fine to me. Um, how, I, how can I kind of tell ahead of time rather than keep pulling this footage into my editor and seeing if it works? There's a couple tricks you can do. A big one that's just built right into the camera is just turn your exposure or your shutter speed, turn your exposure down or your uh, shutter speed up. That way you're letting less light in through the lens and it's going to make some of these hot spots a little more obvious to you. This is just, I'm just turning my iris down and now I can kind of see this is the part of the green screen that's getting the most light on it. I gotta get rid of that. I gotta make it so it's more flat. Another thing you could do, if this is something you might, you see yourself doing a lot, is uh, there's this app called Green Screener. And what this does is it uses your phone lens, it uses your tablet lens, and it looks there, sorry, it uses your camera in your phone or your tablet, and it uses it the same way that your program is going to be looking at it. It's, it's looking at it, there, where's the easy green to take out? And how this works in effect, if this is me using the, the app in our studio, I can see I got this big old hotspot right in the middle there. And what this is telling me is that that green, that area right here is going to be easy to chroma key out. This area out here is going to be harder. And then the darker and darker it gets, the harder it's going to have. It's going to start getting a more degraded, noisier uh, pull. Um, so the good thing about this app, um, just using it, you can use it in real time. So as I'm setting up my background, I'm just moving lights around will give me a pretty good representation of how it's going to look later. So the idea is I'm trying to get that whole entire thing, just one solid block of color. Um, and then you can see here, I try to re uh, recreate because I'm looking for this type of shot, trying to recreate here in my camera lens what I'm going for. I got a nice balanced light right here. Everything around the subject is just one solid color. It's gonna be easy to pull out. So how do we get that nice, even light? Because the problem is, is that if you're using the same lights to light your green screen as you are to light your subject, you're going to run into these problems where you're going to be getting things like hot spots. This is, a, this is an exaggerated example of it, something that we can easily see while we're in the room. But as shown before, the camera and the program see things a little bit differently. So any light, any single bulb light you're going to use is naturally just going to make a hot spot. You can put a bunch of diffusers and stuff on top of it to try to spread it out, but they tend to just the, 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 there's a certain when, when you're kind of like using it when you're looking for it, you're going to keep seeing it. And the 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 way to um, combat this to get a nice flat light is with something called bank lighting. This is something that you can just get at B and H the bank lights just a couple of tubes together. So you got multiple lights in there, all with different hot spots that they're putting in, um, but they're closer together. So it, it can you get a nice even light to it. You can even put diffusers on top of that and just get a night and get a, a flat lighting for just a flat surface. There are ways to DIY this. You don't have to buy these these way. I've seen plenty of tutorials online of how to put things like this together. We here at the studio, this is kind of what we use. We we lucked out that these were already put together when we got here. Someone was using them for a different set or something. And uh, these are just two tube light tubes put in there right next to each other. I got a bunch of diffusers on them to just give them a nice flat light. Um, I When you're, you're seeing like professional sets, um, they, they'll probably have, they'll have tons of these, multiple of these, because you're just trying, you're trying to make sure that you got no shadows on your green screen. We get away with two, and I think a lot, I, two is a pretty good number of what you can, you know, if you get one, you're more likely to get shadows. You got two, you can kind of fill in. And as I showed before, just moving your lights around, you can kind of get, you, you can fill out that area. You can get a nice flat light put onto your green screen. 
Um, so we've got our green screen lit. We're going to move into the next area, which is lighting our subject. And as I showed before, our light, we're just doing a simple key light for the light, backlight onto our actor. So the big thing is that you want to light them um, with enough dis distance between them so one is not affecting the other. So just going one by one, I can, can, sh can show you uh, how the lights we're using. We've got the simple, uh, we've got our key light, we've got our fill light right there. Sorry, let me move my time by a little bit. And then we got our hair light, our um, backlight on the back here. Hair light, yeah. Right. right. I mean, uh, yeah, Ross and I, as soon as you can see from my camera, I don't have a lot of hair to, to share with. What, but what, where this does come in port, where this is um, doubly beneficial for green screening is one, you get a nice solid line on the outside of your subject, makes it easier for the program to know the difference where the green screen ends and where the subject begins. That's an easy pull. Another big one is if you have somebody with a lot of hair, curly hair especially, green can poke in, in and out through those, those curls. Uh, you're using transparent, uh, semi-transparent like semi -transparent surfaces or you're holding like a glass. Having a nice back hair light is going to really, uh, is going to uh, really get those edges to stick out. That way, when you pull it into the program, you're not dealing with uh, a little bit of fuzziness on the edges. Uh, so you want something that's just going to be nice and clear. All right. And obviously, with any sort of lighting with green screen, you always want to be conscious of the scene that it's going to get that it's going to get put into. We have this lit, so it looks like a so it fits into a virtual set. You're not having a virtual set or something like that. It's going to look bad. It's going to look cheesy. But having something Ha keeping in mind of always having your green screen lit, lit differently than how you light your subject is going to make it easier for you to tweak the lighting on your subject so that it easily matches the scene that you're putting it into. Uh, some other things to consider with um, with uh, well, when you're setting when you're setting everything up is when you're setting up your camera. You want your camera's uh, settings to be basically set onto your subject. You want to expose for your subject. You want a white bounds for your subject. Focus for your subject. Obviously, all all that stuff to consider. The important thing is the subject. But if you're lighting your green screen correctly, it's still going to look fine in the background there. Uh, it, other things to consider is if you are um, if your subject moves a lot, uses quick hand motions. Is this is when shutter speed on your camera is going to become important. This is uh, just a still frame of a person moving their hand. This is at a low shutter speed. And this is at a higher shutter speed. And as you can see, when you the key takes it out with motion blur, you're going to have some of that green left over. So what you're going to want is if someone's moving their hands or the, whatever you're filming is moving a lot, you're going to want a higher shutter speed so that you get rid of that motion blur and that you can get a crisp um, removal of the uh, chroma right afterwards. If you really want, you can always add motion blur back in. So it's better just to get that out of the way before even well, like on the day while you're filming, get, get rid of that problem ahead of time. Uh, another thing you can do in your camera to help out um, with um, some imperfections on your green screen, let's say there's some wrinkles that you can't quite get out. Uh, there's some lighting, maybe some gradients in the shadowing. You, you, that, that aren't exactly ideally how you want. Aperture, if you do a lower aperture on your camera, something like we use, we tend to use about like 3.2 for when we're filming here, because we just got a person standing still. We, you want a shallow depth of field so that your subject is, is crisp and in focus, but the background's a little blurry. So that's gonna take away of some, get rid of some imperfections right there. Um, all right, so we got our person lit, we got our, we got our green screen lit, we got our camera ready to go, we're ready to film, we want the person to get in front of the green screen and start talking. Some things to avoid. Uh, this it seems like an obvious one, but it's one that can get, uh, you know, overlooked a couple of times is always keep in mind if it's not in the green screen, it's not, it's not going to get cut out. And so you might be filming this and thinking this okay because okay well on my subject i'm only going to be using my the arms up to the head anyway but now we come into a problem where then that needs to get scaled larger 
uh, you're going to lose some definition there. Even if you're filming in 4K and putting something in a 1080p, you can only scale it up twice as much. So try to frame your shot as close as you can to how you want it to look when it's all done. Unless you're, you know, doing something where you want you want the person to look really tiny on the screen. Uh, but ideally, you want to film as much as possible of the important information as you can. That way, you, you can adjust with it later. So I know some people with DSLRs um, that are more able to do it will film again. If you're just filming a single subject, will turn their camera sideways, vertical, so you can just or so you can just get as much information of the person as possible. Other things to consider: people moving their arms. You know, I, I can crop that out later, but if they're all of a sudden crossing uh, into this light bag here, then it's just gonna be a pain for me. So just uh, always be conscious of where the subject is, if, if they're gonna be falling out of frame, if they're gonna be go, uh, moving their body parts over things that you you, think you thought at first you were gonna be able to crop out, but maybe not now because they walked in front of it. Um, another big problem, and it always comes with just people being too close to the green screen, the shadows. You might think, uh, you know, I took all this time to get the green screen lit. Well, the lights are already there. Just go stand in front of the thing. You're going to get big old shadows, which makes poles harder to do, because now you have all this different colors and information now. You key that out, and you still got, you still got bad shadows and stuff you're going to deal with. If you want shadows in your scene, you can always add them later. It's, uh, it's just better to have more control at, uh, right there in the camera as, as you can. Um, uh, another, uh, so here's another issue with being too close to a green screen, and it's one you might not notice it while you're filming, is that green, any surface with lights on it is going to be reflective. So as, you, as I turn my hand here, I'm getting a lot of green reflected on me, and it's because I'm not properly lit, I'm too close to the green screen. And what this is going to get you in trouble with is as soon as you pull that, that green out, now all that's reflecting on me is becoming transparent. And you'll see that sometimes with other, you know, the, the, that's the biggest thing you're gonna notice with if you're not lighting your green screen separately from your actor is that things are just gonna start getting blended in together. And another, what might seem like an obvious one, but this is something that while we were doing our news program, we probably did this for months and I never noticed. Our logo has green on it. So obviously, the can if, if it's pulling out that, there's a good chance it's going to be pulling that green on there too. Same goes for any items and stuff that you might be holding. This is not impossible to fix. What you can always do is... So we got our background keyed out. Now let's say I just, what I would have to do then is then just make a separate line on top of it and then mask out any of the things I don't want getting green. And there we go, I have my logo back. I have my items back, which is fine. But if these things move around a lot, then you're getting into animation. You're moving, you're, you're, you're you're screwing around with keyframes now. You're put. You're giving yourself a lot of work to where on the set I could have fixed this. Wear a different shirt, use a different pen, stuff like that. It's just uh, things you always you just got to be conscious of. I don't have any blood on there. All right, and obviously this goes for clothes too. When you're wearing green clothes, you're not going to show up. All right, so we've got our scene. We did all this stuff. We lit everything the way we wanted it to get lit. We filmed it the way we wanted it to look. I've got my shot now. I'm ready to put my footage into the back, into the scene here. But, you know, there it's things we could have missed. There's mistakes we've made. Nobody's perfect. Uh, there are, so I'm gonna show you uh, things you can adjust to clean up shots. Um, without giving up any of the uh, definition or the integrity of the footage you shot in the first place. So putting this into my scene. Right out of the gate, I can see, whoops, I left that light in the side over here. Well, that's not a big deal because if we are looking for where our person, where we had, where we had planned this before, the subject was gonna get moved off to the side. 
anyway. So that's easy enough. We just got to move this over there. That takes care of it for me. So now we are going to be using uh, our keying, our keying program. And like I said, I'm using After Effects. Uh, what I'm going to be using is Keylight. So programs like uh, Adobe Premiere have a, uh, that's still Adobe, they have just a, a, a less robust version of it already built in. Avid is a very similar thing. It's just called Spectrumat. Um, I can't remember what the one, uh, Final Cut I use at home, but it's got a pretty simple one. I don't remember, I think they just call it Chroma Key or, or something like that. And like I said, DaVinci Re uh, Resolve has what they call 3D King. So there's a lot of programs. They all maybe name it a different thing. It's all pretty much doing the same thing. Putting it on your footage and you are just telling it to get rid of the green. Now, right there, that's not bad. That's pretty good. That's pretty close to exactly what we want. We got rid of all the green and we got our subject in here and I'm not losing a lot of information anywhere. Um, these, these, uh, these effects do offer some fine tuning stuff and they offer different ways of looking at it so that you can maybe see some things that you missed. And this is a big one is screen matting. So screen matting is just showing you what the green screen is doing. It's transferring everything into basically two colors, black or white. Get rid of all the black, keep all the white. So if we go to spectrum at, I can see, uh, all right, maybe I got a little couple mistakes here. I got some up on the top here that's still around. Maybe I'm, even in my glasses, I'm getting some reflection here. So with particularly in, in key light, how you would do this is you just adjust some numbers on your um, screen mat here. All the all those other programs that I mentioned before has a version of this. They might just call it a little something different. So screw around with the sliders. But as we're seeing here with clip black, we can adjust a little bit of what it's con it's considering to take out. So we we filled in those right there. Easy. Barely even had to move it. And we go in the other direction and it starts keeping some of the things in the white area that we want it to. And pull it back and we got a pretty crisp image right there. Now, some, this is After Effects, like I said, it's pretty robust. It's pretty aggressive with what it takes out. Not all of them are. So there are definitely situations that you'll get into where you'll maybe have a little bit of this green left over, particularly in hair. Hair is a bad one um, that it can happen on. So the easiest thing to do for this is using a, a spill suppressor. Any Chroma King, Software is going to have something like that. Some of them already have it built into the keying effect you're using. After Effects just has a separate one, so that's what I'm using right now. I'm just going to put a spill suppressor on there, and boom, already takes away to that green. All it's doing is just that soft area around um, what's getting matted. All it is is just desaturating the green. It's just pulling out the green a little bit for those little bits that just get stuck in there. Um, if if it's really bad, you might have to start getting into uh, like opening up color correction on your on your footage and actually physically going through and trying to pull out as much as green as possible. Just try to avoid that because if you taking all these steps is what's going to get you to avoid that down the line because that's where you're going to get into trouble. That's where you're going to keep tweaking with things and that's when stuff just starts to get little transparent effects and just starts getting a little ugly and clear that you're just using green screen on the edges of it. Um, so that's pretty much it for at least the, 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 my presentation. I can, I can answer questions. I can go into how it works with other programs if that's necessary. I only have like Avid and Blackmagic on my hands here to use it. But um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than willing to answer. I think I saw one question in the chat. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Uh, what color temps? Um, are, are, are you talking about the um, for the uh, green screen light? Yes. OK. Um, for those ones specifically, those are fluorescent lights. So I don't have a lot of uh, adjustment over to. Uh, I don't have a lot of control over it. Yes, ideally, you would want. Um, you, you would want some control to it, but the biggest thing is you just want all of those color temperatures to just be the same. Anything that's pointed at your camera, they don't necessarily need to be one specific um, 
number because a lot of that can change when you're messing with exposure or white balance on your camera, depending on how your subjects lit. So the biggest thing that's important is just that they're all the exact same color temperature. How about, um, do you guys get into any multi-camera work with green screen or not? Uh, I have screwed around with it before because we use um, uh, the, it, within our studio, they do have a, uh, a quick chroma keying feature already in there. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of the same principles. It's just, if you're doing multi and you're doing it live, all of those kind of need to, like you need all of your ducks in a row then for something like that, like every single angle the the king needs to be lit the like the your green screen needs to be lit the exact same way um or at least like as flat as possible as close to that color as possible i mean when you when you see like you know marvel studios behind the scenes they have that massive warehouse and if you just look up at all the lights and stuff like that they have hundreds and hundreds of lights and stuff set up because that's what you need to do you need to get a nice even flat so that you're not screwing around with it a lot a lot later and especially if you're live um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's the same principles. It's just obviously going to be a lot more difficult to do. So, uh, Scott, um, are you always editing in After Effects for an entire project or just, just the green screen part? It, 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 um, I mean, I personally use After Effects a lot just because I tend to do a lot of effects heavy stuff animations or with green screen for a project like this for elk grove update uh this news program i do everything in after effects yeah but if it's a longer project if it's a longer program i'll just pull my show but these ones tend to only be like five minutes long at most so i do everything just in there that way i don't it just simplifies my workforce if you're doing long projects i yeah i would recommend not doing it in there because after Effects loves to take up your CPU <laughs> speed and, and uh, you know, computing processing. So, right. No, yeah. I just uh, just wanted to know that for sure. Any other questions? Are you using Adobe Premiere, Scott? Are you using Ultra Key or, or something different? Uh, I'm trying to remember what Adobe Premiere calls it. I think it is called Ultra Key in that. No, that's what I've used, but there are other options, but I want to say that there, yeah, and I think I think there's it basically only gives you like maybe a couple features. Like it, it gives you like the ultra or the aggret. I I, I I don't we don't use uh, a premiere a lot. So I that's why I didn't want to say like specifically other programs, what you have to use to call it, but they all sure. kind of do the same thing. They just might have it under a different name. Um, ultra key. Yeah, I want to say it's ultra key. Yeah, I think there's yeah. just here and then ultra key. -er. Yeah, and then yeah, so there. So, uh, and what, yeah, you would just be using that other, uh, like the stuff you'd be using for that is just going through and looking for like uh, mat cleanup or the mat generation to adjust like what's going to be in that black area, what's going to be in that white area. And then skill suppressions are skill suppression, spill suppressions already built into it. So it's probably just a slider right there. Yeah, and then one other question, have you uh, gotten into anything with the floor being green? Is that a whole different world? Yes. Oh, it's not. I'm sorry. Actually, yeah, I should have brought that up earlier. It's totally doable. Um, it's a lot of the same, it, it's, it's the same thing as like, yeah, we're doing it with a white, with multi cameras is now you have to figure out how to light the floor. So that's just something else to be uh, mindful of. Um, my, the biggest problems I've had with that is, um, one getting it dirty. Cause you've got people probably walk on with shoes. Um, so I'd recommend getting those little like knee slipper things that you can put on. Uh, if not, everyone just wants to be so not wear socks. Uh, making sure that you have it really taut using maybe weights or things to keep it down. But the bigger thing is going to be if someone's walking on top of it and creating wrinkles, you want to reduce that as much as possible. Um, yeah, those are pretty much the biggest, I, I would say the biggest um, 
issues that could come up with it is that you know, just getting it dirty and also just making sure that it's always as tight as possible to reduce those wrinkles. But other than that, it's completely doable. I would imagine then you would need some kind of floor lighting then too, right? Right, exactly. So it's like as soon as you start introducing, like if you if you want a bigger green screen than the one we use, you want someone who's going to be walking around and seeing. It all just depends on what um, is is needed for your scene, but the same principles apply. You need that flat lighting to make it easier for you when you're editing. Yeah, I should say I've known people who have used uh, large pieces of plywood on the floor and painted it uh, to use as as the green for the for the floor. Right, uh, which which you, it's been right. Easy. which you can easily do. You can do too. Like yeah, we could do like what we did in the studio, just essentially paint the floor green. What is recommended though is how you see like the fabric curve. That is what most people would recommend doing because that's easier to light. You don't have that harsh light right there, just from a uh, uh, from a corner. It's easier to light a curve than it is light corner. Um, you might have noticed in the shots of our studio that there is a um, a power outlet uh, in the uh, against the wall, uh, which we also had to paint green. Uh, <laughs> For this particular shot, we we have lights plugged into it, but usually those cords would be off to the side at a different outlet. Right, and even you can see in that photo, there's a, there's a ton of real estate of the green screen we don't use, so it's all able to use. It's just how to effectively light it is uh, is then just the the issue that you can find yourself in. So it's a lot of this is just to consider. Um, it's just a lot, a lot of this is just a lot of good information to have beforehand before you start using green screen and stuff for your scene. That way you can get ahead of a lot of problems you might see down the road. I'm curious to know if any of the attendees are currently using green screens and if they've had particular problems that some of Scott's comments have addressed. I used quite a bit of green screen uh, here and as well as in uh, Rapids, uh, did it quite a bit. It depends uh, on how I'm going to do it. If I'm, you know, here we have a much smaller studio here in Marshfield. So we get just way too much spill right now. I kind of gave up on the idea at this point. We have a nice, nice system through uh, you know, last light. I think it works out wonderful. It, taught, it makes the screen taut. Uh, Got two of them with a uh, split in the middle, um, but uh, we just don't have the broom. And uh, the keying, I, I wanted to key as as more in, as live, not live, but get it done, one and done. And we did uh, we did a lot of that. I, I, our, we don't really have a great switcher here to do that in our studio like I had in Rapids. We had a, a live stream unit, which I think was a lot easier. Uh, Dave and I are talking about it again, but I with a different switcher, Black Magic, to do that and uh, keying that out. But uh, right now, our studio isn't what you call humongous. So regardless, you're going to get spill. Right. Yeah. Even like with what with but with what we do with here, we still get you know spill and coming on here. It's just uh, trying to be a conscious of it, trying to be aware of it that we can reduce it as much as possible. Flag stuff off where you can. Um, you know, like it. Yeah, we're, 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 we're small studios. We have a limited amount of space. We're not going to be able to uh, do everything as perfectly as they would on a major motion studio set. But just being aware, yeah, trying to just be aware of this stuff just makes it so much easier for you down the line. So you're not spending hours just fiddling with trying to get this to work. It's just like, oh, the shadow over there, what the heck am I going to do with it? Yeah, we found out that, you know, we I've done it numerous times, numerous years. It's just always seems to have that look that I don't want, um, probably because of the lighting. We have great lighting, but not enough lighting and not enough room to move things around to get those keyed hot spots away because that's always the misery mm -hmm. of it. Um, but, you know, it's also, if you're going to do multi-camera with it, it's just not the thing to do because you get the whack. If you don't use a different background, use one background for different angles, boy, you sure look weird on a set. Right. Yeah. 
And I know like uh, programs like Digital Juice have like um, some virtual sets they have put together, but they maybe only have like three or four shots that are built in. Yeah. And unless you're using like a uh, like a 3D modeling program or something like that, it might be hard to get exactly the angles that you were looking for. But yeah, as much as that stuff that you can like kind of get ahead of as possible, get a, get a clear idea of like you know what your background's going to look like. All right now, I have at least a, a good idea of how I'm going to film it. I know that Sun Prairie Media Center does a two-person interview show using a backdrop. And they, mm -hmm. they shoot it just like a typical two-person interview show with close-ups and two shots and the whole bit. So yeah. I don't know how they succeed in doing that. It's definitely a green screen uh, background. So mm -hmm. well, there are um, there are uh, virtual sets available that have several shots. Uh, I'm I'm thinking for uh, broadcast X if you have that or. Um, for uh, the, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, not the toaster, but the, uh, the um, well, anyway, one of the all, all encompassing, I know I'm going to remember it right after we go off, <laughs> uh, but you could at one time purchase virtual sets that had several shots that you could, you know, switch back and forth in uh, they were but i believe they were exclusively for either broadcast picks or um the other system that i don't know why i'm blanking on uh, yeah tricaster does that yes tricaster yeah we have we have it but you know it's not here in our studio it's in our it's in, we have another tricaster but we can't use it because it's windows 7 and we are not allowed to use it on our network. So that's a dead uh, piece if I want to, I could use it, but I don't want to transfer my files by hard drives. So when it's resident like that in broadcast picks or TriCaster, then are you then liberated from the green screen situation? Like, what does that allow you to do when it's a virtual set like that? How does that work? Supposedly it's set up so that when you change cameras within the system, it will automatically change the perspective of the background. Um, huh. You know, the, the same things still come into play when it comes to lighting and that sort of thing, but that's really all that the virtual set does is just sort of change the angle. Right. And like I said, digital juice just has pre-rendered angles. So nice. unless you're, yeah, you're using something that specifically does 3d modeling, you're kind of set with a pre-rendered background and then just trying to get your for your subject to match. So it looks like they fit in there. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions? This has been very interesting to me. I thought it was great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thank you very much to Scott Meyernick. That was a fabulous presentation. Thank you very much. Um, we will be having this recording available to everyone who registered. It'll be on the WCM homepage. Um, and if you have not, uh, purchased previous webinars, you can still do that and see the recordings. <laughs> so they're all there. So thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.